Welcome to the Primary Sources Podcast from Viral History. My name is Joanne Paul, and I am here to chat with some of the world's leading historians, not just about what they do, the fascinating figures they unearth, but how they do it, and for goodness sake, why they do it. I'm interested in motivations and approaches and how they came to find themselves buried in the past in the first place. Today, it is my very great pleasure to welcome historian Nathan Ammon to the podcast. Hi, Nathan, and thank you so much for being here. No, thank you very much for having me, Joanne. I'm excited to discuss history as always. We've known each other for a few years now via Twitter, which is how I guess most of us end up knowing each other, especially in this day and age. Um, but we still have yet to meet in person, I think. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, we, I think we've been on the same uh, documentaries together, but never in person. Yeah, so we've, we've met um, uh, via uh, the world of television, I guess. We've, <laughs> we've met on screen, but, but never physically in person. We were meant to be on a panel together. Um, I remember I was very, very excited along with, I think it was Nicola Tallis, and we were all going to talk about the Wars of the Roses and the Tudors and everything else. Um, but then, of course, the world ended. Uh, so we, <laughs> we weren't able to do that. Um, how have you been? Uh, yeah, I've been fine. Um, I think obviously the last year has been different. But I think overall, I've, um, I find it enjoyable in certain ways. It's been a good switch off from the world. Um, you can only make the best of what you've got in front of you. So yeah. it's helped with the writing, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, you have published a book in lockdown. So, you know, you've, you've done all right. Um, Nathan is the author of four books, including one that has just been released, Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders. Uh, it came out last week at the time of, of this recording. And he's also appeared on a variety of television documentaries and podcasts. Nathan, one of the things we've been speaking about on this podcast a fair bit is the variety of ways that people approach the study of history. How and when did you catch the history bug? How did I catch the history bug? Well, I don't think I've come to history in your typical manner, as so many other historians have, who have, you know, usually gone on to study history at university. Um, I actually don't possess a history GCSE, believe it or not, um, which does always make me a bit... Um, a bit hesitant to give advice to students who often contact me. Uh, I mean, my history journey began in my mid-twenties, really. I was interested in history at school. The particular school that I went to, we had to make a choice uh, for GCSEs, history or geography. I was something of a geography whiz kid at the time, so th the decision was taken out of my hands in some respects, something I've always regretted because I loved history. Fast forward to my mid twenties. Um, I think it's that time of time of your life when you're starting to try and find something to do. You know, who are you as a person? Uh, a lot of my friends were, you know, settling down, and your social group starts to grow smaller in some respects. Suddenly, found myself visiting local castles, local abbeys. Uh, I've always been a voracious reader, and I started finding myself drawn towards the Tudors. It's just, it's just luck. I mean. I always laugh that I'm someone who's always had these odd obsessions during his life. I have these little moments where I just completely am taken with one subject. And the two days is the one that's always stuck for me. Uh, luckily for myself, I grew up in West Wales. Anyone who knows Wales knows that Wales is an area replete with local history, myths, legends. Combine that with castles, arbies, always on your doorstep. It was just something I grew from there. Um, and quite frankly, I started to do a lot of reading, started jotting a bit of notes down. And it just gets to a point where once you've started to amass all of these notes, etc., you can um, you need to start to do something with it. Was there something about history that had struck you as a kid then as well? Um, you said you loved history growing up. Were you visiting castles and historic sites? Was Was there something that had really engaged you and pulled you in? Um, it wasn't necessarily a single topic or subject. It's just the geography the, of the area, the topography of the area. You know, West Wales is an area that is as historical as it comes. And as Welsh, we're always made to be aware of our history. 
um, you know, it's just something that's always there in the background um, that fortuitously for myself, I managed to bring to the foreground in, in my 20s. So does geography still play an important role in the writing that you do as a historian? Oh, absolutely. Um, let's take Bosworth just as one example. Um, to understand how the Battle of Bosworth, you know, the, the circumstances of Bosworth, the consequences of Bosworth, we need to know the geography of England and Wales. Um, let's, in, let's consider Henry Tudor, for example. He picked West Wales to land. How did he march the Wales? He didn't take the most direct route. He went around the country to avoid certain lands that belonged to the House of York. You need to know that to understand more about Henry's march. Why was Richard based in Nottingham? Why there? Um, what was Henry trying to do once he got to Shrewsbury? He was trying to cut the cross to Hedge London. Richard intercepted him. That's the only reason Bosworth happened at Bosworth. It's all to do with the geography that has played a part in both men's actions. Um, again, isn't Bosworth a perfect example of a primary source uh, in itself? You know, the landscape, the work that needs to be done or has been done to find the marshland so that we can understand the sources that tell us about Richard III's death. You know, geography is integral in the study of history. I just wish that when I was 16 years old, my school didn't play off history against geography. So geography, you've just said, is, is a primary source in, in its own right. And, and environmental history comes into that a little bit too, to try to understand what the landscape looked like at that time. How do we study geography as a primary source? How do we get that information about what a landscape looked like 500 years ago? It's a very difficult one because I guess we've grown up, um, you know, just filling the land as it currently is. Um, I'll tell you something that, that kind of blows my mind is I moved to York um, in 2014. Even now with Google Maps, you can draw back, um, you know, the Google Street View back to when they started doing it in 2008. How much the city of York has changed just, you know, with shops, road layouts within the last 15 years is astonishing. Now try and consider 500 years. Um, you know, yes, of course, certain hills and mounts will be in the same place, but just the way that they split up the fields, just the way the roads come into play. The Bal site of Towton is a perfect example. It's almost the same as it looked during the Battle of 1461, with a sole exception of a major road going through the heart of the battlefield. So you do get the feel of the layout. You can work out where the where the bat where the soldiers um, lined up against each other, where the conclusion of the battle happened. You then also have to take in the fact that there's cars zooming through the heart of the battlefield. Um, but you know, being able to go and stand on that battlefield, being able to view the the descent into what they could call um, you know the bridge of bodies and the bloody meadow. To be able to see that with your own eyes does play a part in understanding just what men went through. It's a fantastic way to connect with the past. Now, Wales, as you've mentioned many times before, has been the landscape for much of your work. And your first book was a, a guidebook on, on Tudor Wales, which sought to encourage visitors to seek out the hidden gems of Wales. Why is Welsh history in particular so important to our understanding of critical periods such as the Tudors? It's simply part of their story. Um, you know, when it comes to Henry the Seventh, we know that Henry the Seventh, the first Tudor king, born in West Wales, um, he was considered a paranoid king during his reign. Um, I understand why. I think it's often been taken to be a negative aspect when it, it's very understandable. But this is something that stems from his early years with his uncle Jasper Tudor. Now, Jasper's entire life was based essentially on the goodwill of his English brother, Henry VI, as the Welsh side of the Tudor family had nothing left, having lost all of their inheritances, all of their offices, by siding with their cousin, Owain Glyndor, during the Welsh Rebellion. You know, I think that this sense of vulnerability is central to the entire Tudor family story. It never leaves. And this originates from their Welsh lineage 
the fact that they lost the rebellion, the fact that Owain Tudor went to London and had nothing. Jasper Tudor, he owed everything to his brother. Once his brother's off the throne, Jasper has nothing. Henry Tudor grew up with nothing. I think it's, it's, it is that vulnerability that comes always through. I think it comes from that Welsh side. So we need to know the history of the Welsh Tudors to understand Henry the King and later on Henry VIII and Elizabeth. You know, they were vulnerable. They felt that sense of vulnerability. So we do need to consider the Welsh aspect of the story as much as the English, because we're all products of two sides of a family at the end of the day. It all counts to make us the, the person that we are. Um, many of us in Wales, we often have our issues, should we say, with how history has developed over the years. You know, we do feel that we have been written out of a history that has been dominated to an extent by, you know, English establishment historians. In the same respect to how, um, you know, BME history and female history is now making its way through this historical narratives. So is, you know, the people, other people who feel that we've been sidelined, i.e. the Welsh. So it's very important to start bringing that story to the fore, forefront as well. So it just gives us a wide understanding of the subject that we're studying. Where do we go if we want to start recovering Welsh history, for instance, in the Tudor period? Um, hopefully to me. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a, there's a myriad, there's myriad sources available in, within Wales, uh, a lot of it in Welsh language. So the ability to have access to Welsh language historians, and it's not as simple as saying people who speak Welsh. I mean, Welsh medieval, that the language is its own subject. There's quite a few very dedicated experts who operate in, you know, um, universities such as Bangor, Aberystwyth, uh, and places like that. We need to be accessing those types of areas. What I would like to see is more, I mean, obviously, you know, we're all struggling at the moment financially, um, institutional-wise, but it would be fantastic if we could have more money pumped in to these type of Welsh universities with these experts, not just for the history, just to be kept within the Welsh academic circles, but to be studied, you know, at an Oxbridge level, um, at a Leicester University level, and so on. Because uh, Welsh history is British history. It's no good just being Welsh history for the Welsh. I think there needs to be more emphasis on the English um, academic world and popular history world to be exploring what's gone on. Because the, the sources are there. Um, we just need to perhaps get more efficient at, at accessing them and using them. And that's something I'm trying to do myself. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's just there. Well, and as you say, we only get part of the story if we don't pay attention to that longer, wider story that involves Welsh history as well. I want to come back to, you mentioned York as well. And you also wrote a book on York pubs, which um, must have been fun to research. Um, I would I would love to be able to, to to join along if you ever write a second one on pubs. Um, and of course, uh, you you turn to the to that subject um, partly because you spent some time living in in York as well. How do you get inspiration from your surroundings when you turn to writing and research? Um, I will stop by saying the York pubs was a very difficult book to write. Believe it or not, um, everybody believes that it's you know a dream um, subject, which I thought. It turns out that to write a book about pubs, you need to spend all your time in the, in the library and not in the pub. Pity that. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I'm not one who naturally, I guess, senses history every which way I turn. I, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't know. I'm not spiritually that way inclined, as opposed to stand within uh, a historic set and feel it. But I think that might be because I've spent so much time at the places I write about, I think I've become accustomed to it. I've become very blasé by living in York, for example, uh, which, which is interesting that, you know, I can walk to the city centre and not even um, glance at this magnificent Tudor building or this medieval building, and you see the people around you who are visiting from abroad, and it's their dream place. Um, but that said... There are moments and places that do inspire me uh, where inspiration can be gleaned. 
but primarily for me at the moment, that seems to be visiting historical places abroad, uh, places I don't know much about, places I haven't become so accustomed to seeing on TV, in person. I mean, during the writing of Henry VII and the Two of Pretenders, I visited Dublin uh, and Waterford in Ireland. I visited Bruges in Belgium, Tournai, uh, Dendermonde, places like that that I'd never been before. Um, places that removed all preconceptions of what they were like. And that really did allow me just a couple of moments of being there, feeling it. So I think that's where I am at the moment in my, you know, uh, currently it is, I think I need to go to those places that I knew and that's where I can be inspired. That's where I can let everything drop away and just imagine myself. Because I don't know the history then of the road layouts, what buildings you see, but it's, it's new, new places. Um, I think we're all very aware right now of, of how difficult it is to feel connected to the past when we can't go places, um, when we can't, um, for me, it's always accessing manuscripts, you know, um, seeing where uh, the, the ink touched the paper and, and where people um, were in that moment writing a word. For some people, yes, it's standing within a building. Um, hopefully, very soon, we'll be able to um, explore the past more directly. We have to, of course, talk about House of Beaufort, um, which became an Amazon bestseller in, I think, three historical categories. It was an undeniable hit. As someone who's also writing a history of, of, of a family uh, at the moment, I'm especially keen uh, to know what your process was like. How do you tell the story of a family as a family rather than telling the story of a series of individuals who happen to be related? Um, I think a key thing that I learned during my writing journey on House of Beaufort is the importance of narrative. Um, I know that to some, this has been a controversial topic at times, um, perhaps considered at odds with traditional academic writing. But as I'm outside academia, and so are a large section of our readers, many, many of those readers are looking to be taken on an adventure during the book. I think it, it is absolutely possible to do this whilst maintaining thorough rigour to the history. You know, nobody's saying to, to you, uh, you know, popular history, you need to be almost delving into the world of fiction. It can still be as thorough in your research as academic history. Now, I view my work almost in terms of a movie. Uh, individual scenes or chapters that need to follow up and lead on to the next one. You're looking for that golden thread to take you from the start to the end. So the Beaufort, for example, I knew straight away this was going to be the story of a rise, a fall, and a rise again of one dynasty. That was always my golden thread. So at every single chapter, I knew what this was going to lead on to in the next chapter. Now, the most difficult aspect of this was maintaining full concentration on the principal members of that family. I knew where I wanted to start. I knew where I wanted to end. The start, John of Gaunt. The end, well, Henry VII, Henry Tudor. I needed to get from one to the other. Now, that did mean I had to exclude some of the more interesting characters because it was taking me away from that golden thread. Um, take Joan Beaufort, for example, the Queen of Scots. Now, her life deserves an entire tomb to itself. But in the context of my particular book, which again, John of Gaunt to Henry Tudor, it was a deviation across the border that just had little to do with the story I was telling. I covered her life br briefly because it is very interesting. But my story was about her Beaufort brothers back in England. So she was pus pushed to the side. You know, you have to be ruthless in staying linked as closely as you can to the overall theme or the story you're trying to tell. You can't tell them all. Um, unfortunately, that does mean if you are writing a family history, people are going to get written out of the story. I think disproportionately for our period, that would be women being written out of history, which is a shame. Um, Luckily, we have an array of historians at the moment who can tell those stories and bring them to life on their, in their own merit. Because um, I, I strongly urge someone to tell John Beaufort's story by itself. It shouldn't be just a story in other people. Um, but yeah, the most important thing when telling a family story is just not to get sidetracked. Um, 
if your story is about family during the time of Charles II, for example, you need to keep all the focus on the family, their journey, their views of royal decisions, not the royal decisions themselves or how the royal decisions were reached, but the family's views, the impact on their lives, rather than telling the story of Charles II and his life. You know, that's not for your book. Your book's about your subject. I think the key thing I'm trying to get to is you have to always keep your family the stars of their own book. And I think that's the key, key point. What sources are most useful in, in telling that story of, of the family as, as the, the centre stage? I suppose the difficulty is, is that, of course, when we're writing about the medieval period, the majority of the sources are always going to be about the kings and queens. So when it comes to the Beauforts, for example, they are there mentioned briefly in an array of sources. All the chronicles, all of the parliamentary roles, uh, you know, the patent roads, the, the state papers, they're mentioned. You've really got to wade through all of that content and try and just glean the little odd snippets. And what amazed me was once you did get all these snippets from all these various sources, where they're just mentioned in passing, you start to build up, uh, you, st you, know, you start to build up a timeline of what they are, and then you're adding in the context around that. Um, I'll give you an example. I know that the Beauforts were present at the battles of Tugden. They were present at the battles of St. Albans. I focused heavily on the sources for those battles to really write around the family and the context. During the Wars of the Roses, the Beauforts were not present at other battles. They weren't at Edgecote more. So I didn't write about it. You know, I mentioned in passing, oh, by the way, this battle occurred, but I'm not going to waste my time writing in heavy detail of a battle none of my guys were present at. You know, they didn't know what went on. So it's a part of this, it's not part of the story. Um, it's just, again, it depends on the family. I think some later families, you started to get the family histories being written about them. If you're lucky to be writing about a family who has one of them, then I'm jealous. Uh, but certainly before that period in the medieval times, you, you, you're just, you're trying to pull out what you can from royal sources. The new book, Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders, uncovers a part of Tudor history I often think is overlooked not just Henry VII, um, who does often get a raw deal as well, but the precarity of his reign in the face of these pretenders. Do you see this work as countering the so-called Tudor myth that we tend to encounter from all sides? Absolutely. Beyond all the mythologizing, um, whether pro or anti-Henry, there's a real man there, you know, a man with real concerns at the heart of this entire story. I always say Henry Tudor, just like any member back then, Richard III, Edward IV, down to your average person on the street, none of them were blessed with hindsight. Henry Tudor did not know how his story was going to end. We can all sit back and say, what was he so worried about? He had a 24-year reign. He, he died a rich man. He didn't know that. He didn't know on a day-to-day -day basis if today was the day he was going to get knifed in the back by someone. There were plots from within this household. That man woke up every day with a heavy burden on him. When you start to put yourself back into his shoes and look around yourself at the shadowy conspiracies, the plots, his inner circle were dying one by one. He was alienated by the last eight years of his reign. You can start to get a better feel for a man who I think has been long misunderstood. He wasn't great sainted Henry who saved the country like Shakespeare has it. He was in this evil, nasty villain more than Ricardo to have him. He was just a man trying to do what we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. Try to do the right by himself um, and, you know, by his family. I say the same thing about Richard III. He wasn't this big evil monster. I think he was somebody whose circumstances have put him in a position where he didn't know how to act. I think that's the key thing is that there are real people behind, you know, the, 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 the myths that everybody is trying to tell. You know, people want to put everything into a nice, perfect black or white scenario. And unfortunately, if only things were that easy, it'd be much better to write about. 
certainly might be much easier to to make that that narration that that movie that you were talking about if everyone in history was a hero or a villain what does a study of henry the seventh give us that looking at the tutors from henry the eighth onwards overlooks why is that perspective going back one more generation really helpful for us understanding that period i think it also brings us back to this again this concept of vulnerability uh how much of henry the eighth's issues of an, an heir, how, you know, obviously a royal heir is important for every dynasty, but I think with Henry VIII, it becomes famously an issue to the point where Elizabeth doesn't even seem to want to go there. Um, I mean, it's moving outside my, my understanding the later Tudor reign, but that vulnerability is clearly, again, a golden thread um, going through. I think that stems from Henry VII and his entire preoccupancy with making sure that he managed to pass on a successful reign. Um, Henry VII's chief legacy is unquestionably the peaceful bequeathing of power to a 17-year-old Henry VIII. Henry VII restored royal power. He replenished the treasury. Um, he rehabilitated England's continental reputation. Everything he did was about ending the Wars of the Roses. Now, I know the Shakespeare and the myth is that Henry's victory of Bosworth ended the Wars of Roses. I believe it was 1509 on the death of Henry VII for the simple fact that he managed to, to linger on to the point where he could pass the crown to an adult heir. The, you know, the first successful transfer of power in 87 years. That, that is Henry's legacy, Henry VII's legacy. I imagine a young Henry VIII would have seen his father desperately ill for eight years alienated, increasingly ruthless, all to make sure he managed to pass the crown on. Henry VIII's mentality was already obsessed with his concept when he became king, and it always would be. And how far does this even go back another generation to Henry VII being a youth and seeing Jasper, his uncle, with no sons, completely preoccupied with trying to keep the Lancastrians on the throne Go back another generation. Or why did it? He left Wales with nothing. Um, I think it's very important to consider Henry VII's reign always when looking at the later Tudors. Running through your work seems to be themes of scandal and deceit, even conspiracy. Is this something that particularly interests or fascinates you, or is that just what the Tudors are all about? I don't think it's been a conscious decision per se for me. It just seems to be where I've ended up. Um, I, I think I drifted away from Henry VIII initially when I started reading it. Uh, I always joke I'm the kind of I'm the kind of guy who's into you know boxing and rugby, and I think a lot of the court intrigue around Henry VIII and the wives. When I go back, go back a couple of decades, you're dealing with wars and battles and more people trying to murder you. I just think it appeals to me more as a person. Um, so I've kind of ended up there. Um, I do often say that I have always avoided conversations on the princess in the tower, as it's something that can't be solved and it's quite frustrating. So I don't think I'm naturally inclined to have conspiracies, but lately it seems the princes are what I'm becoming known for. Uh, and I've never wanted to turn away from work or controversy. So I've kind of dived in with both feet. Um, I think it's just where, where I've ended up. Um, and it certainly keeps you on your toes and keeps it interesting. Otherwise we wouldn't be doing this these podcasts to, to discuss it. So bring on the conspiracies. Do you think that this historical perspective helps to illuminate conspiracies or do we just sort of replicate them? <laughs> Big question. Um, what I will say is my study of all of these medieval conspiracies and trying to analyze and learning how to analyze separate sources is making it's transforming how I view the modern world and the current world. It, it's really informing my decision-making on whatever unnamed major news stories that are of the last few years. It's helping me just try and understand, wait a minute, this is not the, I'm not gonna take information at face value. I need to try and understand the complexities of this topic. And that all comes from going back to the medieval time and going, all right, this source says that Richard III smothered the nephews, his nephews in the tower. He must have done it. 
then when you start to look at other sources, that starts to add a bit of doubt to it. You know, I always say, I think from my study of historians made me a much more grounded and centrist type of person. Not, not necessarily just political, but just in general, you know, things aren't black or white. Let's come back to the middle and try to work out what the actual story is. Um, I know that doesn't always make for the most, you know, drama pleasing um, narrative or information, but you know, this is this is life. This is how it happened. Yeah, there's a sense in which we need to be looking at primary sources in our own age as well a little bit more. I love that point. I'm afraid we've gotten to the quick fire part of the podcast. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hit you with um, a couple of quick fire questions. I'll want you to answer fairly quickly, but feel free to provide an explanation for your answer as well. All right. Who would you rather have a drink with, Lambert Simnel or Perkin Warbeck? <laughs> um, Lambert Simnel. I think Perkin Warbeck was a shady character. I'm not quite sure of his morals. Lambert Simnel was just a child at the time of Henry VIII and his conspiracy. But more importantly, Lambert Simnel lived deep into the reign of Henry VIII. That's what a lot of people forget, is that he lived till at least 1525. He would have been a, a, an old man during the reign of Henry VIII. If you could sit him down at that point and ask him, Lambert, what are your thoughts of what's happened over the last 20 years? You've seen Henry, the, Henry VII die, you've seen Henry VIII come to the throne and all that drama that's brought. You were once crowned a king in Dublin at 10 years old. You've become, I don't know, you know, um, a royal falconer. You've worked in the king's kitchen. I just think he would have been a very great observant of the Tudor reign for his first, what's that, 30, 40 years. I bet you had some thoughts over, over a beer in a tavern somewhere in London. Definitely Lambert Simnel. There's there's a book or or a stage play or something in in that there. <laughs> I Absolutely. think that's that's fascinating. If, if only we had Lambert Simnel's diary. Who are Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck? Uh, Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck are depending on which side of the story you believe. They were either imposters who were put forward to be potential princes, or they were genuinely princes. Um, I have my opinions on the matter which you can read in my book. But either way, they were two contenders, pretenders to the Tudor throne during the reign of Henry VII. Uh, what historic site are you most desperate to visit as things open up again? I think at the moment it's going to be not necessarily a historic site per se, but a historic region, which is Brittany. Um, I visited Brittany about eight years ago, just got in my car and went over didn't take a camera. Um, I just went and viewed things in my eyes. And I've always regretted that I didn't really spend time there and really learn the history of the castles as they pertain to Henry Tudor's exile. So I've definitely got plans to go back. I don't think it'll be this summer, but it's going to happen. So that's the one place that I'm slowly in my mind starting to bring myself back around to. What member of the House of Beaufort would be the worst person to be stuck in lockdown with? Uh, <laughs> um, John Beaufort, the second Duke of Somerset, who is better remembered as Margaret Beaufort's dad. Of all the Beauforts, I mean, when you write a bug for you, do tend to feel a bit of warmth to, to your subjects. It's just quite natural. But John Beaufort in particular, he comes across as a bit of a bitter man. Um, he got captured as a youth in France and he was imprisoned for about 20 years. When he got released, he came out like a battered of hell, but got given a lot of power to take the English armies into France and messed it all up. Um, he was rash. I think he was bitter. He was upset that he was abandoned by his uncle, Cardinal Beaufort, for his transgressions in war, exiled from court. Many people believe he died by suicide. Um, I'm unsure about that, but he definitely died an unhappy man in 1444. I just think he would have been a bitter person. So uh, not fun to watch a bunch of Netflix with then? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, ironically, for what everyone says about his daughter's persona, I think she would have been great fun. Um, certainly not the dour, uh, fervent woman many portray her as modernly. What is Wales' biggest hidden gem? 
In some ways, I think it's the most famous and celebrated part of Wales, and that's Pembrokeshire. And what I mean by that is Pembrokeshire is famous for its coastline, its beaches. If we just consider it based on Tudor connections alone, then that in itself is not just Wales's biggest hidden gem, I think it's Britain's biggest hidden gem from a Tudor perspective. In Pembrokeshire alone, we have uh, Lamphy Bishop Palace, where there's a good argument that's where um, Henry Tudor was conceived. We have Tembe, the home of Jasper Tudor. It still has great curtain walls. Uh, it, has a pla- it has a Tudor merchant's house. Pembroke, of course, birthplace of Henry Tudor. We've got the castle. We've got the statue. We will hopefully one day, very soon, have a visitor centre. Mill Bay, where Henry Tudor landed. One of the most beautiful scenic parts of Britain. Carew Castle, home of Sir Rhys of Thomas, sometimes known as the Hampton Court of Wales. It's littered with more Tudor family connections than anywhere in Britain. Not many people know about it. Yes, you know, scores of people come down every summer for its coastline, but if you're into Tudors, you need to come to Pembrokeshire. That in itself is our hidden gem. Uh, and one day I will make it famous. Well, I've written that down. I also have a Pembrokeshire Corgi, so um, I'd have to bring him along. Um, he, w- he would be returning home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And now for three questions, I'll ask each of our guests. These don't have to be quick fire, so you can take a breath before you answer them. What is your favorite primary source that you have worked on? Um, I always say my favorite primary source, it's not something I've worked on uh, per se, but whilst I was in Leeds Library doing some research into my previous book, uh, I discovered that they actually hold a letter written from Henry VII to Louis XII of France, written sometime between 1498 and 1509. So I kind of casually put in a request to see the letter. Um, It came, and it turns out it was legitimately the original letter of uh, written from Henry VII. Now, you know, we've come across um, actual primary sources in archives around the country, but it just felt... It felt a bit random that they just had this letter in fun. They just brought it to the table. Um, obviously, go wash your hands um, before touching it and so on. I don't think, I, even now, I don't think I actually um, understood the concept of what I was doing because it was so nonchalant. Um, the letter is written by one king, read by another, just to touch it, read it, see it, smell it. Um, again, I just don't think I still grasp how momentous that was. You know, here was Henry the Seventh's signature right in front of me that I could see. So that was always my favourite primary source um, moment, shall we say. As for what I've actually worked on, I think Paul Adol Virgil's work is great. Um, what fascinated me about Paul Adol Virgil, all I've heard about is he was this great Tudor propagandist. His work is a lot more um, anti-Henry and pro-Richard than some might believe. I think it's a lot more reasoned than many give him credit for. He says great things about Richard. He says some terrible things about Henry. You know, he, he has a he has a good a good old go at Henry for his avariciousness, for example, at the end of the reign. It just surprised me reading through the book how um, how fascinating it was, just as a narrative story. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm always a big fan of reading through a bit of Virgil. And who's Polydor Virgil, and what book are you talking about? Uh, Polydor Virgil was an Italian humanist uh, who wrote during the reign of Henry VII and published his work during the reign of Henry VIII. Uh, The reign was the Anglica Historia and was a a history of the reign, um, of the reigns of English kings through to Henry VIII. And he was brought in to to write this? He was brought over to England during the reign of Henry VII. Um, Henry VII was a man who was bred to some extent abroad in France, and he brought a very cosmopolitan approach to his kingship. And one of the people he hired to raise his own prestige was Oliver Virgil. What are you working on next? It's a secret. Um, I, yes, well, you have just published a book, so <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, no, I. what I will say is I've done the Beauforts and I've now done Henry VII's reign. I want to come full circle and complete the story by doing the rise of the Welsh Tudors. Um, the Welsh Tudor family is what brought me into this. Um, I always said 
my interests were the Tudors and Wales, and I combined them early on. The Tudor, Tudor Wales was a great guidebook, um, or a great project, I should say. I'm not too big up the book. Um, but I want to do the, the full story. Uh, it has been done here and there. Um, I just feel that there's a lot more to explore in that story. And again, sticking with that golden thread of moving from the 13th century to Bosworth Field. And I think that will almost complete my little unintentional trilogy. That sounds fantastic. Um, I can't wait to see it. I No pressure or anything, but um, I think that'll be really important for us as Tudor historians to have sight of. And I said, you, you said earlier, you don't like to give advice um, to students, but <laughs> what advice would you give to a historian just starting out? Very simply, um, I was once told you can do it. Uh, again, that, you know, we all have our insecurities sometimes when it comes to this subject. Uh, I certainly have mine. Uh, I'm quite a confident individual, but, you know, I am a bit out of my comfort zone a lot with this. Um, so it's simply you could do it. Just something as simple as that. And I always say, if I can do it, you definitely can. Um, stay enthusiastic, stay encouraged and enjoy the journey because it's definitely an, an exciting pursuit. Um, just enjoy every moment of it. Um, anyone who follows me on Twitter, you can definitely see I'm enjoying every moment of this journey. Yeah, do make sure to follow Nathan on Twitter. Maybe also um, follow the Primary Sources podcast and you can subscribe to us as well and Viral History on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much, Nathan, for joining us and for taking us on a tour through the hidden gems of your history. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for listening to Primary Sources.